first I want to thank for the invitation to speak here um, and also I want to thank the IS for hosting me here this year and um, let's see also I want to thank the people who made the trip because it's uh, really a bad bad day maybe to come due to the weather so um, okay so this is I, I thought that I should talk about a topic that maybe many of you heard at various moments uh, I've been thinking about this for maybe uh, five or six years together with uh, Paul Biran for most of the time and somehow I think it's a moment when we can uh, have a picture about this Lagrangian cobot it just starts to be coherent and also there are many people who probably never heard about this before and so I'll start by explaining a little bit what this is all about and uh, without assuming too much um, so uh, this notion so okay so this is a talk about Lagrangian cobodism and uh, the notion has been uh, introduced uh, so this is uh, the main uh, the setting is that of a symplectic manifold and uh, inside it we are going to look to uh, Lagrangian submanifolds and there is a very simple uh, uh, notion that was introduced by Arnold in 19, around 1980 uh, which is the notion of uh, Lagrangian cobodism and this notion I don't know maybe it's not good if I write uh, here or uh, you can see uh, here it's fine right okay so uh, so somehow uh, why this is very natural is that uh, one would like to classify basically Lagrangian submanifolds of a symplectic manifold and if one thinks about uh, classical uh, uh, algebraic and differential topology the natural notion that first comes to distinguish uh, submanifolds is actually cobordism. And this was the work of Tom in the 50s. And uh, starting from that work, a lot of things uh, could be understood and calculated. And so it's natural to think about a similar notion that uh, is specific to Lagrangians. And the notion that Arnold introduced in a sort of slightly different version a variant of his notion is the following so uh, this will be again a Lagrangian that this time embedded in C cross the initial manifold and the symplectic form will be basically the standard symplectic form you can put there the standard on C and some the initial one on M and this um, uh, Lagrangian embedding uh, should project onto C in uh, the following way. So this is called sometimes a potato. Some other times people refer to this as an octopus. And uh, I will explain what really what this is. So so this is uh, supposed to be a, a Lagrangian that lives in C cross M and if I look inside a finite strip like this it should be compact uh, with boundary and along each of these rays what lives in, uh, in uh, C cross M should be of the form array which is just this curve in the plane cross one Lagrangian in M so gamma is really this curve and L uh, I can uh, put some uh, indices for them because they depend on the different indices here so this will be L3 and then I would have another ray like this and uh, gamma cross L2 here and gamma uh, maybe this is gamma 3 this is gamma 2 gamma 1 cross L1 and similarly at the other ends and for reasons that uh, you know I, I just got used to denoting the negative ends by primes and the positive ends by uh, else and so uh, there's nothing really complicated about this it's an embedding I have to go into a manifold so compared to classical Kobode theory I have to go into a manifold that has dimension 2 bigger than the initial uh, 
uh, Lagrangian L because, um, well, it has to be a symplectic manifold. So I have to raise the dimension by two. And then this condition just tells me that the only ends of this construction are at infinity and the, each of the ends looks like a certain Lagrangian in M cross uh, line in the plane. So, um, and on this side, I'm just indexing the ends by L1, L2, L3. On this side, I, I put these curves, but later on, I'll not write these curves anymore that correspond to the ends. So the simplest Lagrangian in uh, C cross M is in fact a curve multiplied with the Lagrangian in the fiber. And this is uh, the shape of these ends. Yeah, I want to consider these curves are horizontal. So this is unfortunately my hand that uh, made here a little non-horizontal deformation. Yeah, I want them to be really horizontal. Uh, y y there are many other things you can do. And we'll maybe discuss a bit. You could push them a little bit like this. But in fact, I, want, I prefer them to be horizontal. But there are uh, other possibilities, OK? So for this notion, so Arnold only considered the case when you have one end here and one end there. But actually, these things with more ends, is, it's interesting. It's useful. And all right, so now um, I want to, yeah, I'm going to split this board. So the only thing is uh, uh, to just read my notes, I need my glasses. So this is a kind of a, a sign of wisdom, maybe. I don't know. But um, OK, uh, so there are some basic, basic uh, associated uh, notions to, to this type of construction. And these notions you can always, uh, well, I mean, some, sa some are really actually spe spe a bit specific, but some are uh, sort of general, uh, um, general uh, things you can do for, uh, for w whenever you have this notion of cobody. So the first thing is a bit specific, and it's called the shadow of a cobody. And it has to do with the fact that the cobodies can be projected in the plane. And that in the plane, so yes? The yes, plane. sorry. So uh, you, you're, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I should say what this is indeed. And uh, what's the notation for this is? So the notation is going to be, this is a cobodies between L1, L2, L3. And I'll write it like this, like a map. Uh, and the result is going to be L1 prime, L2 prime, L3 prime. And obviously, I can have a notion like this with as many ends you want. And these lines, I want to put them as integral height. So I, this uh, gamma 1 is really the horizontal line uh, at height 1, this uh, horizontal line at height 2, and so on. Okay? And I can have as many ends as I want. And All right, so now I want to talk about something that's very natural to do with these cobodies, and that is to uh, compute their shadow. So it's a shadow of a cobodis. You see a cobodis projects into the plane, like this potato here. And so I can compute the area of the potato in the plane. And basically, that's a shadow. However, I have to define it a bit carefully. I cannot just take the area of the projection, because the projection might have holes. And so the way I'm going to do is uh, suppose v is a cobodis. I will denote all the time pi by pi, the projection from C cross M onto C. And then I'm going to define the shadow by doing, uh, I take, uh, uh, so I'll denote the shadow of V. It's equal to the area of the union of all bounded components in uh, C minus V union with V. So I take the region that is formed by bounded components, components of C minus pi V, and union also with V. And I take the area of this region. And so this is kind of a natural way to measure cobodies 
by taking the projection and taking it. So in this example, it's obviously just the area of the potato. Yes. Uh, union pi v. Yes. Thank you. So in that example, it's just uh, that oops, that uh, area, but. Uh, But just to give another example where it's a little bit different, um, it could be that the cobodis looks like this. So it's a little region here and a region here. So it could be like this, and with a hole in the middle. And then the, the shadow is the, all the area in blue. So this would be the shadow of it. its area of uh, this region. OK, just to see that there is, uh, all right. OK, so, so that's the first uh, thing you can do. And uh, in terms of this natural type of uh, notion, so this is very natural because it, you, you want to kind of measure the size of these objects. And there is no other immediate way to do it. Now, other things that are sort of immediate. So we are used when we define cobodies to immediately define some category involving cobodies. And in this case too, one can define a category. So you can define a cobodies this category. And the cobodies category, we will define it like this. So the objects are uh, Lagrangians. Um, in M and morphisms, this we have many choices how to define exactly a morphism. But uh, my choice will be the following: I'm going to take a cobodis V that goes from L, and the other side will be um, so. Maybe it's better to if I draw this. Uh, so, um, so a morphism from so this this is something that belongs to the morphisms from L to L prime. So you see there is something a bit uh, funky here. Um, L appears here as one end of my cobodis. L prime, the target of my morphism, appears also as another end. But then I have these other legs, which I all drew on this side. Now, if I would have liked to have it very symmetrically done, I should have drawn maybe these legs going down or something so that they don't look so asymmetric. But let's not worry about the fact it's symmetric or not. It's, it's, uh, we, it's better to draw it this way because it fits with the definition of cobodis I gave before. And uh, so how do you uh, glue things? How do you compose in this, uh, if these are morphism? Well, you are going to glue uh, this exit with the uh, entrance of the next cobodis. And then these uh, other legs, you shift them down and so that they go around whatever you glued there. And so it's a correct defined operation. And it's a bit strange, but it's, it's, uh, it's OK. All right, so that's another uh, thing one can do. And then besides having this sort of uh, category, the other, the other thing one can do is to define a cobodis group. So you can have a, a cobodis group. And the cobodis group, uh, how, how do you define it? It's uh, the usual definition. So you define uh, uh, the cobodis group. And this is uh, um, a group spanned by or generated maybe over Zima 2, if, if you want to keep it very simple, by all Lagrangians in the manifold. And uh, you will say that uh, you have a relation of the type L1 plus L2 plus LK equals 0. Um, if uh, there is a cobodis. So that the L1 up to LK are the ends, and you have no uh, positive end. 
And so you take all such uh, relations, and this you look at the group spent by all these relations. You model by all these relations. All right. So now, uh, okay. So we have some uh, given this uh, sort of very general setup. Yes? Yes, you're absolutely, it's a good question. Uh, the so the natural notion of group here is non-commutative because as we will discuss later, there's a lot of subtlety having to do with the order of the ends. There is no natural reason why the ends should permute but if you want to do something really naive, which I really wanted to do for a while, uh, you just put the free vector space with this. And so I put the relations like that, and it doesn't really matter. But if I would really want to do something more, uh, more refined, then I would put the uh, order here. This would be the free non-abelian group. And then here I could put L1 dot L2 LK. And that would mean that really they show up in this order. All right. But for now, I don't want to do that. I want to say, what are the questions that you can ask if you do this sort of natural uh, construction? And uh, basically, the purpose of my talk is to show that this, uh, uh, this sort of natural you know, sort of constructions and these questions once you start to solve the questions, then you see essentially most of the things we know about Lagrangian topology showing up in various interesting ways. And so, um, uh, okay, so what are the questions? The question is, the first question here is maybe do, uh, uh, so maybe this shadow notion, which is kind of a measure, do they lead to some sort of metric? So the basic idea is that you would like to put some sort of distance among Lagrangians to compare them. Now, why is this not trivial? The reason is that uh, Lagrangians are not of the same topological type. So some might be a tori, you might have to compare a tori with a sphere. And so you cannot do like C0 necessarily metric because the domains change. And so uh, finding a sort of distance or topology on the space of Lagrangians is very uh, interesting if you go beyond maybe uh, things that are isotopic. And then even if they are isotopic, there is a Hofer metric there, which is also a notion that's very specifically symplectic, where there's a lot of rigidity. So having a matrix is not uh, at all a trivial, uh, trivial issue for, for a variety of reasons. So that would be the first thing. The second question that's natural would be, um, well, if you have a, a category, you remember that was my second, uh, well, my second thing was on this board that I lost around here somewhere. Um, right, so now once you get to this Kobodis category, the second question would be uh, to would be to say, is there some sort of a functor from this category of maybe topological quantum field theory type that go, or some type, in any case, some sort of uh, relevant, uh, uh, um, some relevant uh, type of uh, functor. So this category, I didn't call it anything, but uh, I, we will call it now. So we'll call it the Kobodis category of M. So uh, with objects uh, and morphisms there. And so is there some sort of functor from here to some uh, algebraic, some algebraic category to some, something like vector spaces or some, something algebraic? So that would be the second uh, natural uh, question. And the third natural question would be, OK, if you have a Kobodis group, and if you remember what the classical algebraic topology does, it, it classifies Kobodis via Tom maps. And 
you would expect to have some sort of a good map that goes from this Lagrangian cobodis groups into, again, some sort of tom type space. And ideally, this map should be an isomorphism. And then the, you would be in big, you know, great shape because you could compute all, all uh, these cobodis groups by computing maybe this side. All right, so now what I want to talk about really is that uh, the, the basic uh, answers to all these questions is uh, yes. So it's yes, yes, and yes. That is, out of the sh these shadows, you can extract some metrics. Out of the, you can construct some functors, as I mentioned before, and there is something to put here. Now, besides these three yeses, there's a lot of buts also. And uh, that's the part that I'll uh, have to explain. And I'll explain how this construction uh, takes place. And uh, uh, the, the various constructions uh, happen here. Okay, so now another thing that's lacking for now, but I'll explain it in a moment, is that uh, I have to give some examples of uh, this Lagrangian cobodism. Yes? Two was a thing with, uh, it's hidden, you see, so, but uh, maybe it should be hidden. But, uh, so two is a thing with, uh, with a functor. So there should be a functor from cobodis to something that's algebraic. And uh, that's a second question. And okay, now the third question is hidden, but it was about the Tom group, the Tom space. All right. So I, bef before I go uh, further, I want to give uh, uh, two examples of uh, of cobodisms that are a little bit non-trivial. So of course you can do trivial examples by taking a curve in the plane and crossing with a Lagrangian. That would be uh, very simple, but some uh, slightly non-trivial non examples. So the first one is called Lagrangian suspension. And it's associated to a path of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of M. So that, uh, well, well, we'll take it to be a loop. And to such a path, you can associate a Hamiltonian function that uh, uh, generates it. Uh, gamma t. And then you can uh, do the following construction. You can define the following object. So it's denoted L power gamma. And it's defined like this. It's T. Um, and then H, T, and gamma T of uh, x. And gamma T of x. So this belongs to uh, C. And um, C cross M. And the first component here is a real part. And this second component is an imaginary part. So this writing is, this I'm identifying this with R2. And the first component here is T. And the second component is maybe this y. So this y, this is t. And then uh, I have another component, which is in m. And I have to rescale things a little bit so that uh, this extends to infinity. And my gamma t, uh, I can make it to be constant to the identity for all time less than 0. Ah, so this is a, a diffeomorphism. Gamma t is a, uh, gamma t is a diffeomorphism of uh, a, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of M. And so gamma t of x, x is in uh, M. So uh, I should write maybe x is in M. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm moving x by this diffeomorphism gamma t. 
and uh, that's the component that's in M at the end. So uh, all of this is in M. And then I'm calculating the value of the Hamiltonian on the point T that, uh, so let's do a little picture actually for this. So, so the projection of such a thing would be maybe something like this. In case my Hamiltonian is positive, it goes from zero to something. And so at moment, at moment T, uh, the maximum value of the Hamiltonian, so the values here are h of t and gamma t of x. And uh, x here, uh, I said something uh, wrong here. Uh, I'm associating this to L. So x is in M indeed, but it's also in L, which is itself in M. OK, so what I do is I'm moving. Uh, I'm moving uh, each point in L by this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. I get points in a new Lagrangian, which is uh, gamma t of L. And uh, when I view it in C cross M, I have to add this component, which takes into account the Hamiltonian function. And uh, so this t, so I'll write it maybe here, t is in R. And uh, x is in L. And then uh, this formula makes sense. OK, so. Right, so the Hamiltonian, I should, in fact, extend it for negative uh, time so that it's constant. And I have to make it constant at. Uh, at I can make it 0 by rescaling, right? So this is kind of th the reason why I drew it like this. If I want to draw, draw it like this, I have to scale it in such a way that h for values bigger than 1 is 0. And so and uh, this point here would be uh, 0. This point would be, uh, say, 1. And after that, the Hamiltonian has to be 0. And before, it has to be 0 so that it looks like this. OK, so this is a little trick that is very uh, often used in symplectic topology. If you have a Hamiltonian that generates a one parametric family of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, you can perturb a bit this, uh, rescale the Hamiltonian in such a way that it's constant uh, equal to zero here and on the other side. Right, but thi this is even more standard. I mean, you can move it up so that you make the Hamiltonian positive. Because, I mean, you're only interested in the flow, so you can you add. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what. In any case, this is a construction that's very uh, sort of classical, and it's called Lagrangian suspension. And there is another construction, and this gives a cobordism if you do this rescaling at the ends. And so there is another construction which is called Lagrangian surgery. And uh, uh, maybe I'll, well. Let's move on to this other side. So this uh, construction is, in a way, even simpler. It really uh, is a generalization of looking at these two Lagrangians in uh, C, uh, the two axes. And uh, if you have the two axes, you can obviously kind of have a handle, attach a handle and move from the two axes to this picture. And in C, of course, there's no problem to check that these are Lagrangians, because these are just curves in the plane, so they are naturally Lagrangian. But a similar construction can be done in all dimensions. Remember, Lagrangians are of dimension n in a manifold of dimension 2n. So if two Lagrangians intersect transversely, they are intersect in, uh, in, in points, we will assume that they are maybe compact or they intersect in just finitely many points. You can, in any case, pick one point and do uh, handle surgery around these points. And by looking a bit more carefully at this picture, uh, you obtain that, in fact, 
if you have two Lagrangians like this that intersect in a few points, you can do the surgery in all these points, and the output is going to be a cobodis that basically looks like this. So you'll have L1 or L and L prime, and then the result is going to be L. Now, here it's the notation is a bit misleading. Uh, this is notation for the uh, connected sum in general. But if you do the surgery in more than one point, the result is not the connected sum. It's like a repeated connected sum smoothly. It's like you would eliminate, you know, do this handle attachment at all of the uh, intersection points. So this will not be directly the connected sum. So maybe I'll put a little sign like this. In any case, the thing that's important for us is that you get a cobordis uh, that looks like this in this case. <laughs> all right. So. All right, so now uh, I want to explain a bit the answers that uh, we're getting. So the interesting part in this, and uh, that's why, in fact, all this, this uh, topic is non-trivial, is that uh, the answers depend a lot on some sort of um, some sort of uh, dichotomy between uh, flexibility and rigidity. So in uh, symplectic uh, and in symplectic topology in Lagrangian topology, there are some sort of uh, topological restrictions. Restrictions on uh, Lagrangians that you can impose. And these restrictions have a lot of consequences. And I have to discuss them a little bit. What are the no natural restrictions that one can put, and what the consequences are? And the first, well, I'll start. Uh, I'll, I'll start with things that are flexible here on this side, and I'll end up with some things that are rigid on this other side. And the, f the first thing that's flexible is to just not put any restrictions. So this is fantastic. And I'll denote it by G. So these are general objects. I don't put any restrictions. Now, the next stage I want to, to have is something that's called weakly monotone. And um, the next stage is monotone. The next one is exact. And uh, one after that, it's something that I'll call Hamiltonian orbit. And I'll explain a little bit these things. Uh, so OK, I have nothing to say about this one. Uh, weakly monotone means uh, following things. So there are two important sort of geometric um, or topological uh, um, Morphism that one has for a Lagrangian submanifold. And the first one is a Maslow index. And the second one is an integral of the symplectic form. And weakly monotone means that these two things should be proportional, but without any other. Uh, additional condition. So weakly monotone means mu is equal to rho omega. Now, uh, for some rho uh, real, the second condition, which is monotone, is more uh, constraining. It means that rho should be positive. And the second part is that uh, the minimal Maslow class of an element of positive area should be 2. So uh, this is called NL. It's a number. NL is equal to greater or equal to 2. Sorry, yes. So the minimum of uh, mu of alpha for omega alpha positive should be bigger or equal than 2. Thank you. And now exact means that basically the 
ambient symplectic form is exact and it pulls back to each Lagrangian and there it's a form that's again exact. And Hamiltonian orbit means the following thing. So it means that I'm only looking to Lagrangians that are Hamiltonian isotopic to a given one. So it's a kind of a restri I'm restricting my set of Lagrangians more and more somehow. This is actually a bit different restriction because it might be that you have Hamil uh, Lagrangians that are not in these classes, but are all Hamiltonian isotopic to a fixed one. But from my perspective, this is a order of going from flexible to rigid. And <laughs> so now these conditions might look to people that are not in the subject very strange in the sense that they seem a bit uh, coming from uh, the blue. Uh, why, why exactly these conditions? And this is one of the issues with the whole uh, construction, but and the whole, in a way, uh, one of the issues with the subject in the sense that some of these conditions are required for technical reasons. Some are not required just for technical reasons. And in any case, we will see, however, that they make a huge, huge difference in terms of the answers to our questions and how, how things go. And uh, I want to also fix a notation. So I'll denote Lagrangians in a certain class by in this way. And the star can be any one of the letters I put there before. So the star could be general or uh, weakly monotone or monotone or uh, exact or H in case I'm talking about Hamiltonian, things that are Hamiltonian isotopic to a fixed thing. And also I want to have a, rela uh, a sort of uh, inequality in terms of this relation. So if I write, for instance, that star is bigger or equal than weakly monotone, that means that all my statements are true for all the choices that are more rigid than weakly monotone. So there might be some, some moments when this is useful. In I'm going to write. OK, so now let's see some answers. Um, so first I start. Uh, all right, the first uh, question was a thing with a shadow, right? So this was, uh, and uh, I should say, I think I said at the very beginning that most of my work is joined with Paul Biran. And uh, then this part with the shadow, this is joined with uh, Egor Shelukin, who uh, will actually talk just after me about a different subject. So, all right, very good. So, uh, so what's the theorem in this case? So theorem A is the first thing is that if you look at this uh, uh, distance or di uh, ah sorry I have to define it first time a little bit uh, so we're gonna define we're gonna uh, pick two uh, Lagrangians LL prime in one of these classes and we're gonna define <laughs> something that we would like to be a distance and it's very simple what we should do. We should look to cobodies from L to L prime and uh, take the minimum of all shadows, or the infimum of all shadows, and try to see if this is going to give something of interest. So uh, I take infimum over uh, the shadow of V for all Vs that go from L to L prime, and V in one of these classes. Now, there is something special a bit here. Uh, of course, I have to look. Uh, v is a submanifold of C cross M. So if I want to take one of these classes, I have to take it to apply it to C cross M. And I didn't quite say what means if I take this star to be this Hamiltonian orbit case in this case. So wh what does it mean, uh, uh, sort of Lagrangian? So what I want to understand by that is in this case, I take a Lagrangian, which is uh, uh, Cobode, is it's a Lagrangian suspension. So if star is H, the notation means that V is a Lagrangian suspension. So it's a particular choice I make, but this is natural for the, for the whole picture. 
because in that case, all this L and L primes are all Hamiltonian isotopic. And I'm only looking to cobodies between them that come from a Lagrangian suspension, like the type of uh, cobodies I defined before. OK, and so now uh, the result. So you might have some free energy. That's the well, so sorry? So you have L and prime and you have L one. No, so this, to, for this thing to work, it's a very good point. For, zi for the next statement to make sense, I have to take one end, one end. If I take more ends, it doesn't work anymore. Well, uh, e the we'll see the statement, and I'll say what the problems are, OK? Um, all right, so but that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, OK, so what the statement? The statement is, first of all, that uh, All right, so, so the theorem A. So it's, uh, well, it's a statement that goes a little bit along these conditions. So the first case is if star is general. In that case, what one can say is that D star S is, uh, ah, in fact, all the time you can see directly from the definition and this composition of cobodies, everything, that this is, in fact, a pseudometric. And now the question is, when is it a true metric? And uh, it's a pseudometric that might be infinite, too. In case there is no cobodies between two L and L primes, then it's the value is infinite, obviously. But uh, the question is, when it is maybe a metric? And so in this case, uh, ds star only, only takes values 0 and infinity. And this is based on the, this proof is simple, but it's based on the H principle. And uh, it used uh, an input from Amy Murphy, who, uh, who suggested, in fact, that this is the case, this is true. So in this case, what happens, essentially, if you, no, all dimensions. So what happens in this case is that if you have a cobodies between a Lagrangian and another Lagrangian, then y essentially you can use a H principle to reduce its shadow more and more by kind of pushing it closer and closer together. When you do this, it's going to be immersed. Uh, it, it will not remain uh, uh, embedded. But then you use uh, the H principle for uh, immersions, and then you surge the immersion points. And essentially, at the end, you, you get something that is very small. But uh, so that's the first thing. So now, so in a way, this shows that nothing interesting here <laughs> to look for because, uh, well, OK. Now, if you are in more than weakly monotone, then things are better. So this is a metric. And um, Moreover, one can, can find, so uh, there are L and L prime that are not even smoothly isotopic. And still, uh, this uh, metric is uh, not 0 or infinity for them too. So that means that this is somehow interesting. It's a true metric. Uh, something is going on. Yes? What's that? No, I don't know. The, no, no, definitely. It's not always less than infinity, but I'm just saying there are LL primes for which the metric is of interest in the sense that they are not normally comparable by uh, whatever other techniques there are. and. No. Yes, it's an extended, I don't know, metric. <laughs> yes, so this metric can take value infinity. We accept it because there might not be cobodies in that class between two Lagrangians. And then, 
All right. So now the other thing that's uh, kind of uh, worth mentioning is that if in this case, if I take star equal to h, this is a Hofer metric. Is the Hofer metric for uh, for Lagrangians? So in a way, that means that the, this sort of construction is very natural because uh, it reduces to to a metric that it's well known and well studied, and then it gives more things in the case when things are not uh, Hamiltonian isotopic. OK, so that's the first answer. Now uh, I want to discuss a little bit an answer that's a say, oh, this, uh, right, I'm uh, a little bit behind, but, um, but OK. All right, so now for the second question. So remember, this question was the one with the uh, functor relating this Cobodis category and something algebraic. And we will see that this is something that's very familiar to, uh, to symplectic topologists. So I'm going to take here this constraint to be at least as rigid as monotone. And in this case, I want to fix a Lagrangian in my class. And uh, then uh, there is a simple functor that I can define. So the Cobodis category in this class, I'll put a star to say that this is uh, what uh, the type of Lagrangians and Cobodis I consider. So they are all monotone. And I go into vector spaces. And the functor is simply uh, the floor homology of uh, L and N. And so the theorem that's really central for this stuff is the theorem that's joined with uh, Biran. And um, this says the following thing. So the first thing is that AFL, this, uh, this definition really gives you a functor. So of course, the thing that's important, I define this on objects. But the thing that's important is how it's defined on morphism. So th this is a part that's really significant. So FL uh, uh, extends to a functor, to a functor. So the second part is that uh, in case, again, when uh, I'm in the Hamiltonian case, then uh, FL coincides with uh, Zeidel's representation. Uh, in the Lagrangian version. So this comes down to something that's very well known. So what, I what this means is that if I look to only cobodies that are Lagrangian suspensions, then the value of this functor becomes something related to a construction of Zeidel. And I'll explain this hopefully in a moment. Now, the, the next um, the next uh, step, the point C of this, is that, in fact, this functor um, admits an extension uh, in the following way. So it can be viewed, or a lift, rather. So lifts and uh, so uh, there is a category that's called the Donaldson category. And I can look here at Holmes of L and something. And this takes me to vector spaces. And this is my functor FL. And the claim is that it leads to a functor here. So basically, what this means, in case you don't know uh, much about the Donaldson category, just means that this construction is very natural in, in, this, uh, in this variable n. It, it's very, very natural in it. 
And so you have a functor that, it's, that has values into a category that controls all floor homologies. Um, and further on, there is another more refined version of this. And uh, um, okay, and so this uh, more refined version is the following. So uh, there is also a further lift. lift of this uh, of this functor f and uh, to think about it uh, you have to know that the donaldson category it's a category whose uh, objects are lagrangian submanifolds and whose morphism are the floor homologies between pairs of such lagrangians and this category admits uh, Uh, an embedding into a larger category, which is called the Dirai-Fukaya category, which is a triangulated category. And the construction of this triangulated category is pretty involved. It's been done rigorously by Paul Zeidel. Uh, and um, the important structure here is that it's triangulated. And this is important because Lagrangian submanifolds, uh, it's hard to imagine how you can decompose one of them in, uh, with respect to others. And as soon as you have this triangulated structure, this can be done. And so basically, the situation is that we have these functors that goes here. And then what happens is that for any triangulated category, you can build a sort of enrichment of it. Uh, what I'll denote by d fook with a tilde on top. And what it means is that you look at a new category whose objects are families of the objects of the first category that's triangulated, and whose morphies parameterize all the ways you can decompose objects into uh, 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 iterated triangles. So this is a little bit uh, complicated, but basically this uh, category, the morphism in this category, encode all the ways you can decompose in the derived Fukaya category and objects in terms of others, as iterated cones or exact iterated exact triangles. And on this side, you can also build a sort of uh, a rich category that I'll denote by Cobb uh, with, a, with a tilt. And there is a functor here that uh, lifts this f from down here. So what is this category? So I'm not going to say too much about it. It's sort of a category whose objects are families of Lagrangians. And the morphies look, if you want to go from a family to another family, the morphies look basically something like this. So this would be a morphies from the objects L1, L2, L3. And uh, the family L1 prime, L2 prime, and so on on this other side. Yes? So what You're right. And uh, not only it's ordered. So I have uh, really a family for me means L1, L2, L3, and uh, I'm going from one family to another family. And, and this is the same principle here. And the way you can just to think about this stuff, you can think that a picture like this means that I'm decomposing L1 as L1 prime and L2 prime in some form. And so I'm now decomposing the whole family in terms of this. And somehow this, this square is supposed to reflect that. All right, so now, uh, OK, I want to only say a word. So I want to go back and explain this uh, result a little bit. That's right, exactly. Right, and uh, actually, the existence of this functor, what it means is that, but I'll explain this in a moment, but what it means is that each time I see a cobodis like this, that means that L3, for instance, can be built up out of these ends in a very specific way that's prescribed by the cobodis. And the way it's built up is uh, making use of this uh, 
uh, uh, triangulated structure here, it's essentially saying that L3 is a iterated cone of L uh, of the L primes on this other side. All right. So the the last uh, result I want to make. So the So here is completely geometric. The transition from here here is, uh, of course, uh, floor theory. But I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll explain this in a in a little moment. I want only to say what's a presumptive answer to the last. Uh, so I'm a, I, I was very slow at the beginning. I realize, um, and the last result it's again joined with uh, Paul. And. Uh, is that there is a sort of a tom morphism in the correct, again, with the correct constraint here. And this goes, the result here is a, the k group of the derived Fukaya category of n, the Grotten d group of this category. And maybe I'll denote this by psi. So I will not talk too much about uh, this, but I'm just saying that there is an answer to my third question. And now what I want to talk about for the last few minutes is to explain a little bit what is behind this uh, theorem uh, B. So theorem B implies B implies uh, both A and C with some additional work. But uh, uh, basically, one could say that the main uh, sort of the main ideas how to approach these questions come from this theorem uh, uh, B. And uh, so I want to explain a little bit about theorem B. And so basically, we have this cobodis. Uh, and we have this ends maybe n and n prime. And we said that we are constructing a functor that's FL, that FL of n is HF of L and n. And so now we have a morphism. And to a morphism, we have to decide how do we associate uh, how do we associate to a morphism uh, um, well, FL of V. So if this is V, I have to decide what is this morphism. OK, and uh, so this is a basic thing that one needs to do. And that's where all the analysis that comes into floor homology is of use. And it's going to be very simple, I hope. Uh, but I think it is very simple. So. You one can do the following thing. You can take a curve in the plane. And uh, let's call this curve gamma. And then I can consider a cobodis of the simplest type, which is just gamma product with L. So remember, L was my fixed Lagrangian that I want to use uh, for all my, my construction. And then let's assume that I can somehow define floor homology in this situation. So suppose that the floor homology of this gamma cross L and uh, V is defined. Now, if it is defined, this is generated by intersection points of uh, uh, between uh, this Lagrangian and uh, V. And what we see here is that, in fact, uh, we have intersection points that are just over this point and over that point. And so this is going to, these intersection points here, maybe over the point P, are all living in the fiber. And there are intersection points, in fact, between L and N. We can assume them to be in transversal position. So this is going to be CF of L and N. The other one, uh, the other. Uh, intersection points that are also appearing are the intersection points over Q. And these are going to be CF of L and N prime. And of course, these are have to be defined, these complexes, with respect to certain uh, almost complex structures and so on. But we're going to take some almost complex structures that 
are uh, of the type uh, I cross a normal complex structure in the fiber as long as you get away from a strip, a vertical strip like this. And then the differential here is going to look very simple. You have to look a little bit at how these holomorphic strips you remember that uh, in floor homology, the, the differential is given by holomorphic strips with boundary and the two Lagrangians involved. And so if you really look at this picture, you'll see that the, the strips can only go either strictly in the fiber over Q, either strictly in the fiber over P, or they can go from P to Q when projected in the plane. So it's an orientation issue. You cannot have strips going in the opposite order here. And because of that, the differential is going to look uh, dn uh, here, or dn prime here, 0, and then it's a phi, which is reflected by precisely these strips that go from one side to the other. And this phi is exactly the map that you are going to put here when you take its, its value in homology. So it's a very, very simple construction, and it just tells you how to define this. It goes from, when you take it in homology, it goes from here to here. Why is it? A chain map. Well, because this is a, is a chain complex, the square of this matrix is 0, and this is equivalent to the fact that phi is a chain map. And uh, OK, so now then, for instance, the uh, second point, the point B of the theorem, this is something uh, that is joint in joint work with a former student of mine called Charette, Francois Charette. So if this is a, this is a Lagrangian suspension, then by working a little bit hard uh, more on, on uh, the specific form of this phi, you can see that it is the same, in fact, in homology with, uh, with uh, Zeidel uh, representation in the Lagrangian case. And uh, just uh, uh, sort of the other steps, which are much more uh, complicated, in fact, uh, steps uh, C and D, so in, in that case, maybe just to give the rough idea. Um, so in that case, you again do a sort of a similar scheme as what you do here. But you, you compare, for instance, the complex associated to, to uh, maybe let's call this n and n1 and 2 n3. And then this comparison Lagrangian by L. And then you compare the complex associated to this curve with the complex associated, to, for instance, to this curve. And then this complex here is going to be, again, a sum of three parts. And then you look at the structure that appears there. And the structure, again, will be very specifically sort of constrained by orientation issues in the plane. And because of that, in fact, you will be able to write the complex that you have here as an iterated cone in three stages over the complexes that are on this side. And this will give this decomposition result that phi at the end are translated in the derived Foucault category. And uh, OK, so then the last uh, thing, uh, the, the theorem what uh, C the one with the k0 group. This is a direct consequence of this sort of type of decompositions. And the uh, result with Egor, uh, this is uh, sort of uses the same type of tricks as here, but then you have to use to work under what's called the bubbling threshold. So it's a kind of an issue where you modify just a little bit Lagrangians and and uh, finally, I wanted, in fact, to uh, use uh, like a quarter of an hour of my time, but of course I'm now very uh, late, about talking about how all of this kind of gets blocked at some moment, this sort of constructions. But uh, there is recently a new way to look at it by using immersed Lagrangian or flower theory. And uh, then, uh, OK, there is a version that takes place in Lefschetz vibrations that I haven't gotten to talk about at all. But uh, there'll be somebody who's going to come here and is going to probably talk about this, in whose name is Wei Wei Wu. So there are some other exact sequences in, in this business besides those that I constructed. So you see, I, there are some decompositions I construct using cobodism. And there were some sort of exact sequence of this sort 
associated to then twists that were constructed by Zeidel. And it turns out that those fit perfectly well in this Kobordi setting too. Okay, thank you very much. I stop there.